a lot of interesting things, a lot of success comes out of a place of adversity. Business of Architecture, episode 425. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm speaking with Drew Lang, who is the founding principal of Lang Studio, an architectural firm based in New York, who specialize in delivering the traditional architectural services in numerous sectors from residential, cultural, and commercial work. They also deploy their architectural lens of problem solving to help solve clients' business and strategic challenges. And they've also been architect developer. Um, notable projects include the Hudson Woods project, which is a great example, and a collection of 26 dwellings on 131 forested acres in the Catskills region of upstate New York. Drew is originally from New Orleans. He studied at Yale University and settled in New York City in the early part of his career. And this is where his practice is now situated. He's also the founder of a community called Brick and Wonder, which is dedicated to supporting and connecting real estate and design professionals. Drew is an active advocate for positive collaboration. And in this conversation, we discuss the challenges of being architect developer and how they resolved many of these issues in the Hudson Woods project. We talk about the power of collaboration and community and why your network really is the backbone of your business and how this philosophy led to the creation of Brick and Wonder and what that is. And we also discuss the future of architectural business and strategies that are involved for creating a long-lasting design-led firm. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Drew Lang. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Drew, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm great, Ryan. It's great to see you. Fantastic. Now, I'm very excited to be speaking with you. You are the founder of Lang Studio. You're also the founder of Brick and Wonder. Um, Your company, Lang Studio, kind of straddles a number of different domains, architecture, obviously being the sort of predominant one, a traditional architecture studio, but you've been involved in development um, and kind of doing your own projects, Hudson Woods being one of the most notable ones and a very interesting um, project. And you're also, as I said, founder of Brick and Wonder, which is um, a network of collaborators, architects, engineers, other consultants, people working in the AEC industry space. And I must say, your website has got some of the nicest headshots of team members I've ever seen. We just redid our headshot. So thank you for that compliment. I'm going to pass that along to the team and the photographer as well. Uh, Really, really lovely. And we we often talk about, um, you know, kind of creating a face behind the architecture and creating a sense of emotion. And all of the pictures just made me smile and filled with joy. And yeah, it looks great. looks very, very cool. We had a lot of fun doing those. And and I'll tell you, we get to this in the conversation, Ryan, but a lot of what we do lately more and more is around getting to a, pl- a joyful place. Mm-hmm. And it it's something that is lacking in, in, in my mind across our industry and that I want to get to more of uh, with our studio. And it's something we think a lot about in our Brick and Wonder community as well. Yes. Well, it's it's interesting, actually, the the seriousness, if you like, that many of us end up kind of getting entrenched in into the architectural right. industry. And, right. And, and this can come across in all of our communication and it ends up creating a bit of a gap and a bit of a void between us, clients, other collaborators. And actually, this is that connection is part of the magic of running a successful business. I couldn't agree more, Ryan. And look, whenever we get to that place, um, that joyful place, uh, and get get in and get into uh, this 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 um, zone where you know things are really running smoothly, it's so wonderful and and such a different place from you know the place we often get stuck in. You know that rut mm-hmm. of seriousness, if you will. So, tell me a little bit about how did Lang Studio 
come about? What was the what impetus behind setting up your own studio? Well, it was something I always wanted to do from from the beginning of starting into architecture. It happened a little sooner than I anticipated, and it happened in part because I, I had a real estate development opportunity alongside uh, my first private architectural commission. And so I, I you know, left the nest of um, somebody else's studio, a former professor of mine. It was a wonderful place to work. Um, I worked there for five years for Stephen Harris, uh, who was a professor of mine at Yale. And it was a great training ground. In a lot of ways, I was sad to leave and still think very fondly of it. But um, had two very good opportunities. One, a, um, a gut renovation of a large studio in Soho in New York. And, um, and simultaneously, a really interesting real estate development opportunity in New Orleans, which is where I'm originally from. And so those are the two things that, that sparked um, the launch of my studio. Brilliant. And in those early early days, how were you finding work? How did how did you build your pipeline? Right, right. Well, I I, I always thought of it um, uh, as a dual pronged approach, and now it's a multi pronged approach. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was always architectural commissions, client commissions, and self generated work in the form of real estate development projects. And so I really have always tried to have both running simultaneously. And I've, I've always known instinctually, and this was reinforced and um, of course many times along the way, most notably uh, following the 2008 crisis, that it, it, we need to have different sources of work and we can't be solely reliant on client commission work. Um, and so, you know, look, it, it, it happened for me really no differently than anyone else, um, with respect to the client commission work very slowly, um, one contact at a time, one commission at a time, you know, at, at first it was just me for a number of years and then little by little, um, building a team, but um, when you're starting out doing the work yourself, as well as going out and getting the work, um, you know, that's challenging, needless to say. So, look, it happened slowly. Um, it was a struggle. I think we um, died several deaths along the way and then were reborn, right? Um, so, I mean, we can get into those stories if you'd like. It, I don't think my story is so different than other people's. I mean, one death we experienced was following the recession. We built up a team. Um, by the time 2010 came around, um, I had gotten to the point where I had to let everybody go. And it was back to wow. being just me. Um, you know, I was really at the brink of truly dying and um, was giving real thought to closing up shop. Um, and at that point, um, I decided to launch a larger development project. That, that was, um, I think I was emboldened by um, the, 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 the depths of that depression, if you will, and it was a real depression in many respects for me. Um, I mean, I was down in the dumps, I felt, terrible um a young child who'd just been born and of course felt a lot of pressure on the home front sure. uh, including my wife uh, insisting that i go out and get a job um <laughs> and so i did you know out of that i launched our hudson woods project which which right. became our largest self-initiated development project to date and you know and that's that that that's proved to be really transformational hmm. And, um, you know, look, I, I, I owe it to the Great Recession in so many ways, right, that, that, that I was compelled um, to, to take that sort of leap, to take that sort of risk. And it was a great deal of risk, but out of it came a great deal of reward. 
Well, this is this is very fascinating. I mean, you know, the many people I've interviewed, 2008 has been a real pivot point in their businesses. Either businesses got started because jobs were lost or businesses went through this kind of intense contraction, as you're describing, and it was kind of forcing people to, OK, which route do we go? How are we going to get out of this? How are we going to how are we going to survive? Um, so moving into development and taking on a project like um, Hudson yeah. Woods, that would seem, well, in, in, emboldened is a great word. Um, what were the, what, how did this come about? I, I'd been mulling over the, the set of ideas we, we, we carried out for quite some time. Um, so I felt, I feel like it had been brewing and, um, you know, really it was a matter of going out and executing these ideas. Um, what I realized as I went out and looked for property is that um, th there were lots of property out there. And so I found it a bit confusing um, and wonder where am I going to do this? And um, I just followed my instincts on, on that and, on, and, and ultimately found myself returning again and again to, to the Hudson Valley, specifically to the Catskills, the, mm -hmm. um, the western Catskills just west of the Hudson River. Um, and the place we ended up is exactly 100 miles from New York City. It's about a two-hour drive. Um, you know, it, it, it fell into this sweet spot, if you will, um, that married up with the set of ideas I had about um, marrying people's desire to escape from the city, to have a refuge outside the city, um, combined with um, having access to a well-designed home. Um, uh, and... and um, you know, providing it to them in turnkey form so that they didn't have to go through the process as, um, you know, as someone does over a period of many years of finding a piece of land themselves, hiring a group of professionals, including an architect and a contractor and others, to go through the process of entitling land and building on land and taking construction risk. Um, we packaged all that up um, in, in, into a product, into a home product, if you will, and and offered that out, and it turned out to be something that people were were really clamoring for, were, were really looking for. Um, um, sometimes explicitly, wow, people came and showed up and said, I've been looking for this for years. And, and, and other people happened upon it and said, wow. Um, um, I didn't realize I was looking for this, but now that I found it, I realize it's something that I've been wishing for for a long time. Um, so could, and could and mm -hmm, this was pre-pandemic, by the way, right? We, we was at this point take the pandemic for granted, but all this occurred um, and, and was hatched before the pandemic happened. So can, can you outline what the what the business proposition was and how it differed from your usual architectural services? Right. Um, the architectural services that we usually provide were all packaged up in this product that I'm describing, right? right. So in a sense, those architectural services were invisible. And right. um, it, it turned out to be part of the magic, right? Because I think part of the reason why it's so hard for people to work with architects and so hard for architects to find people to work with is because it's so opaque what we do and it's so complex. Um, it involves a lot of cost, a lot of time, and a lot of, um, um, you know, the complexity and opacity. And we took um, essentially the development proposition, engaged that, and it took the form of buying a piece of land, um, bringing in capital, to develop that land, um, packaging up a set of resources combined with the, the, the house product. Um, and those resources included um, financing resources so that when people bought a home from us, they we could lead them to banks 
um, they could borrow money from um, to construct their home and buy their home. Um, it, it led them to um, attorneys to help them, you know, make their purchase. It led them to insurance brokers to help them insure their home. Um, it led them to all sorts of um, furnishing resources. So we created a whole package of furnishing options, and that was a lot of fun. We teamed up with a, a lot of local makers in the area and put together a what we called a maker resource book. Um, and we had a lot of fun with that. Our buyers had a lot of fun with that. Um, and um, we also packaged together, you know, what it ended up being the marketing um, or storytelling, right? And that became also something that was very fun for us. Um, we were telling the story not only of uh, our design, design and development process, Ryan, but we were also telling the story of this place um, in the mountains that was really magical and, um, you know, was primarily about nature, um, and, and I can experiences through the different seasons and nature and access to different towns where one can experience the town's histories and culture. And so there are endless series of stories to tell around that, right? All of which tied back to our development project, um, you know, which ended up evolving into a community, okay? And, and, and that then became another uh, layer in the story, right? So there were 26 lots on our 130 acre property that we developed. Okay, so 24 um, families, um, in some cases individuals, but um, most of the time families uh, bought in to this community and became community members. And, um, you know, now we're on the other side of it. Okay. I had a home there with my family for a period of time as we wrapped up the construction and for a bit of time thereafter. And so I was part of that community. Um, I'm no longer physically there uh, on a regular basis, but I do still feel very connected to that community, and I'm very, very connected to many of the individuals. Um, you know, so the, it continues to be part of my story, and you know, I take a lot of pleasure in those relationships and having been part of the creation of this community. So. Um, Really, really satisfying, Ryan, and a very different way of being an architect. But I think um, integrally tied to um, the, the inherent nature of being an architect, which is the yeah. creation of place, right? In, in, in a way, it's, it's more architectural it's more being an architect than regular architectural services because there's a there's a, a massive vision here that you've kind of got control over and also you're broadening your perspective in terms of all of the different moving mechanisms and parts that actually facilitate a building from the finance and insurance and all the all the kind of collaboration and then actually well actually we you know we can be in control of that as well rather than leaving it to a client to try and figure it out themselves with us kind of being in the background um pointing a little bit here and there uh, and it, it, that's quite a from, a from a business perspective kind of moving towards a much more vertically integrated model of of construction and services which would provide a, a quite an extraordinary client experience I, I i'm glad you 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 picked up on that and said that ryan that that it, it represents more of what being an architect is is about than than it might ordinarily in a practice of mm -hmm. architecture. Um, I have felt along the way in my professional career that that the practice of architecture has become too limited and limiting, and um, and that largely comes from a place of 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 fear. Um, and aversion to risk. Um, and um, I think the shedding of responsibility over time, um, over the life of the profession. And I'm very interested in reclaiming that. Um, and, 
you know, what I've realized is we did in Hudson Woods have a very vertically integrated effort. We, we acted not only as architects and developers on that project, but we also acted as the construction management team. So we essentially were the contractor. Okay. We also acted as the marketing and the sales team. So we did all the marketing and sales directly ourselves. So it was a tremendous learning experience, a very, very steep um, learning curve for us, Ryan. Um, I, I, um, I won't necessarily continue our practice in that way where we're so vertically oriented. Um, I learned that while I was able to carry out the construction with our team, it's not our core strength um, or our core set of interests. And, you know, I, I, I like to collaborate with builders um, who, who are better at, at, at building than we are and more suited for it than we are. And, and you know, this has to do with um, other aspects of, of carrying out a complex project as well. But, right, I, I, um, we're able to do more as architects um, when we become developers when we put on developer developer hat and um, one of the satisfying things that has come out of the experience for us is we've had a lot of people a lot of colleagues come to us and ask us about our experience and I'm always very very happy very pleased to to help other people go in this direction when when there's interest and provide whatever guidance and resources that that that, that I that I can because I get really excited when um, architects are interested in taking their visions and implementing those visions um, and, and going beyond simply being um, an architect in a conventional sense. Yeah, very very um, interesting, and obviously this is a desire that many other architects hold and obviously they kind of might have experienced in their own practice like you're saying that, that that traditional practice can become quite constraining or has a lot of um you know inherent obstacles around it and challenges around it and actually the the desire to be your own developer um or be your own client is very appealing to a lot of architects and i do think that architects are we're very well positioned to be in that developer seat if you like because of the because of the nature of architectural thinking and discourse is very propositional where we're able to look at a site and see potential whereas perhaps the traditional realm of development conversation is much more seeing the development as a financial instrument or purely as a financial instrument rather than seeing it as a as a community or a place um, and so there's that longer term vision that's in, involved interesting you're saying there how actually the construction side of it that was probably quite difficult and and i've heard of many architects in the past who have, have who have attempted to do both architecture and construction construction is often the one that becomes quite hard to do simultaneously as the architecture was there anything specific about construction or being your own contractor that was that was very challenging <laughs> Oh my God, Ryan, it, it, it's so many stories to tell there. Um, look, it, it was very humbling and I have a great deal more respect for contractors now than um, prior, <laughs> prior to acting as a contractor myself. Um, look, it, it's um, it, a lot of the challenges revolve around Get, getting to a concrete understanding of what lies ahead of you. And, you know, this was particularly the case for us with the site work. So we were dealing with a large site and we were digging into the ground um, all the time, right? And, of course, didn't know what was beneath the ground before we dug into it. And so trying to understand what you were getting into um, was really impossible. And so, um, you know, look, we learned that we needed to set ourselves up in an agile way in order to work through that. And, um, you know, the, the, the only way to learn there was to make a bunch of mistakes, which we did. Um, 
we hired our initial excavation team and they um they they ended up taking advantage of our naivete and well, almost sunk us i mean it 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 if we, if we didn't see what was happening ryan um they 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 would have sunk the project and it would have never gotten built right so mm. uh, fortunately we were able to come together with a second excavation team who became our true partner right and so you know a lot of what i learned in the in in, in doing the construction is the success of it is tied to um the the the, the strengths um, and the integrity of the the partners that I was able to come together with, right? So building buildings is super complicated, right? Um, this is obvious, but what isn't so obvious, and what I really had to learn is that, wow, I need other people. Um, and not only do I need other people, but the success that I'm going to have is is integrally reliant on the strength of the other people, the partners and collaborators that I come together with. And so, wow, we, we, we had a lot of success along the way. And, and I attribute that um, entirely to um, the strengths across all of our team members and all of our collaborators. And, and, and you know, that applies to our internal team, um, but it also very, very importantly applies to our um, external team, you know, a whole series of partners across the Hudson Woods project. It was dozens, hundreds of partners and collaborators, right? So um, because we built uh, on 26 properties, we built over 50 structures um, and um, um, not just built them, but went through the entire life cycle. Um, associated with the building, um, uh, you know, together with the owners and together with the partners, I saw over a period of about five years is when all this occurred. Um, many cycles occur, um, and when partners lasted with us through more than one cycle, what I saw happen is, wow, this gets better and better, um, and we have more and more trust in one another um we're giving one another more and more energy and what i saw happen ryan is those efforts started to lead to other things that extended beyond the hudson woods project so um we started to get inbound inquiries from um, people asking us to do things similar for them and we saw our partners also getting inbound inquiries. And as that happened, we brought one another into these other efforts. And so, you know, right. one good thing led to another good thing, right? And it, 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 because there was so much going on, there was this rippling effect that's still happening to this day. I mean, we literally yeah. are contacted um, um, many, many times a week, sometimes many times a day. Um, uh, and the, in, the, in these forms of correspondence is the semblance of, of, of Hudson Woods and is the semblance of, of, of the people that we worked with. And oftentimes the literal mention of Hudson Woods and a literal mention of these collaborators. And pe people saw this, they still see it, and they're really drawn to it. Um, they're drawn to the value set. They're drawn to the, um, the, 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 the resulting... Um, you know, form that it took, you know, with, yeah. a, with, with, with a, you know, respect for nature, you know, we, we, we left the natural beauty of the place largely intact, you know, and then there's kind of a subtle insertion of um, modern architectural elements, right? So it's, it, it, it's about all these things, Ryan, and, you know, it was so um, wonderful that it led me to, you um, we want to formalize this dynamic, if you will, of collaboration and um, a commitment to a set of values around collaboration in a certain way, and and um, and and that's what what led me to start our Brick and Wonder community. It was it was it was out of that experience, and it was out of, out, out of these um, 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 these values, if you will, right. 
I, 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 it's so interesting how the the collaboration relationship aspect kind of rears its head as being the the driving force uh, to making stuff happen, and it kind of you know reflects in the quality of relationships that you that you have determines the quality of output and and product. Um, w when you first started the Hudson Woods project, and you, you were saying earlier how this kind of was born out of the recession and this was in actually actually in a position because many people would conceptualize of okay if I want to move into development this has got to be something that we do when we're when we've got an abundance of cash lying around and we're development but actually you're describing something that happened that after something you know a, a contraction in the economy and in your business was it relationships then that allowed this to happen what was the what were the, some of the first moves that you made to start taking it just from a, an idea into what it became? Yeah. Um, look, if, if, from the very beginning, I, I, I wasn't afraid to reach out to people that I knew and people that yeah. I didn't know and ask them for help. And there are a lot of things very quickly that I needed to do that I didn't know how to do. Um, I could do a back of the uh, envelope um, financial calculation, but I couldn't get much beyond that myself. And so I tapped a close colleague to help me run um, our financial models. And this is someone who um, was a friend and a colleague when we first started into this. Now he's a very, very close friend and a very, very close colleague. And he worked through the Hudson Woods project with me and, you know, we continue to work on other things to this day, you know, and, and, and that's been the case with so many people. Um, uh, in, in the legal realm, in the insurance realm, in the construction realm, in the um, product supply realm, uh, you name it, marketing, photography, um, all the touch points over the life cycle. So yeah, look, it, it's, it's, um, you know, I was really, um, clear starting into this about where my strengths were and where they weren't and where I was going to need help. And I needed help in a lot of places. Right. And so I was reliant from the very beginning on other people. Tell, tell me this, Ryan, you, you, you work with a lot of people across the industry and, you know, we've talked about constraints and how people are constrained yeah. and, you know, w w the kind of things that leads them, that lead, lead them to, you know, get out of their comfort zone, if you will, or out of these places of constraint. What do you find leads people to those places and, and, or not, right? What, 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 what okay. keeps people? Um, from going to those places. Well, adversity is a big driver, absolutely. Um, and these, these kinds of scenarios of um, being forced into a situation of, of change can really encourage or empower, embolden was the word you were using earlier, to have people step outside of that comfort zone. Um, and I find that that's always very, very interesting. When something unexpected happens, there's an adverse situation that this often calls upon something where, you know, people go, people go, people start digging, digging deep, if you like, um, and will really start making a, making a change. Other people I've, I've noticed will often have just a hunger, a hunger, for, a hunger for kind of continually challenging themselves and doing something different. And there are these ideas that start that kind of that won't go away. They won't go away, and so people kind of end up feeding those ideas and being in the right environments. That's often one of the catalysts for for growth of ideas that I've seen a lot of people engage in. That makes sense. Yeah, That's adversity like, and hunger. Um, yeah, I agree. Well, it, 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 it's it's interesting because two thousand and eight really was one of these periods where so many people I've interviewed have spoken about it was 2008 everything got wiped out and it was this opportunity to reset and to ask myself the question is this really what I want to be doing is this the direction that I want to go and well no it's not 
what more can architecture, the industry, offer us? What more is, is possible? How can I change my way of practice? So it was a great sort of realignment, a painful realignment, but a great sort of realigning lesson, if you like. And I think certainly in business that the many, many opportunities are born out of the, the difficulties or, or a failure or when we're trying to do something the way that everyone else has done it, where, where that's actually a very dangerous strategy. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And it's, it's look, one of the reasons why we're in a really, really exciting time, right? Um, so at the current moment, we're entering into a, another recession, likely won't be as dramatic as 2008 was, but um, and we have a bear market and rising interest rates and right challenging set of conditions. Um, you know, the, 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 the larger set of challenges that we face um, globally or, or um, along environmental lines, you know, and having to do with the with global warming and the threats to our planet, right? So I, I'm really excited about the opportunities in front of us in relation to that adversity, right? And um, uh, you know, it's it. I'm always looking for for interesting opportunities that tie into that. I I don't I don't know what those opportunities are going to be that we latch on to, Ryan. But um, but but I'm on the lookout for them. So you know, no no question that that that. Um, a lot of interesting things, a lot of success comes out of a place of adversity. Yeah. Problems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Problems to be celebrated. I mean, we know as architects that, you know, it's very difficult to draw or design a building with a complete blank canvas with a featureless site. And it's the constraints that give juice and richness Ab to absolutely. architecture. And it's and it's very much the same thing in, in business. And a good business has at its core the ability to solve complex problems or problems that are emotionally fueled from people. And a recession causes pain and it causes problems. And if we're willing to kind of raise our heads above the parapets of the firefighting that comes with re recession, there's often the silver lining or there's often um, opportunity that again, it's not always a comfortable journey to to sail, but it's often it's often present. And so, looking for problems, I think in in, in businesses and looking for problems as as architects, this is where we start to open up a, a very interesting conversation. Um, you know, certainly when we're starting to think about the problems of our clients, for example, and the different challenges that they face when you know if they're a professional developer versus a residential client and as you were saying you know, with, with the Hudson Woods projects well you know actually you're starting conversations around insurance you're starting conversations around bridging finance and loans and money and as an architect being able to broaden the scope of conversation which is what we're great at we're great at being generalists and knowing a little bit about everything and this is one of the this is the the, the deep generalist idea right um, it lends itself very nicely to being able to provide more intelligent and sophisticated solutions for for clients and for different businesses. Uh, and again, I really I'm a big believer in the power of architectural thought as a lens to be looking at problems and and not even not even necessarily putting together an architectural proposition. Just the power of using an architectural lens to evaluate and identify clients' pains and problems in and of itself is incredibly valuable, incredibly valuable. And we've seen a lot of businesses who are, who are becoming very good at doing that before even making an architectural proposition, which is you know, very, very, very fascinating. And um, coming back to um, Brick and Wonder, which really is a quite a, a, an amazing kind of offshoot of all of this type of conversation what what was driving that how did it how did it grow and and how would you describe what it is right it, it it's a professional community um comprised of leaders across the built environment so mm -hmm. it it's it's cross-disciplinary and um, it's all about the people 
and it's all about their relationships with one another. And and um, when we see success occur in the community, uh, the greatest form of success, it takes the form of people collaborating with each other on projects, right? There are other yeah. um, inklings of, of, of success that we have that occur um, – at a granular level in the form of conversations that start um, common interests that are found sharing of resources with one another, you know, of learning together um, leapfrogging. We like to think of it, right? So rather than reinventing the wheel on your own coming together with other people and um, learning what they've learned so that you don't have to, go through the learning experience yourself because so much of us are really forced into this place of isolation um, where we have to reinvent the wheel time and time again. And so we're, 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 we're trying to solve that problem for people in our community, right? And lead them to this place of leapfrogging um, through their careers um, with one another, right? Uh, over time, right? So that's the key. It's, a, it, 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 it's about a long view towards success um, together with a group of um, curated colleagues and collaborators, mm -hmm. right? Who share a set of values and a mindset of abundance versus one of scarcity mm -hmm. or the notion of positive competition versus, um, mm -hmm. you know, adversity and negative competition, right? Where, okay, opportunities yeah. are scarce. And so I better keep all this knowledge and all these resources to myself, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So look, I mean, very much interested in flipping all these behaviors on their head, you know, that, 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 that are, I think, the norm in our industry. I think the, yeah. the starting place for people is a place of um, distrust, right? And and um, we're trying to bring to people a place of trust that they can step into with one another. And look, like I said in the beginning, this is about getting to a, more readily to a place of joy in our work day to day and you know, to, to more and more successful outcomes and more of what we think of as a flywheel of success where where one good good thing one good relationship one good project leads to the next good relationship and good project and good set of outcomes right and um it's still early days ryan the in its current mm -hmm. form the brick and wonder community is two and a half years old and we're already seeing really, really exciting forms of success that people are experiencing with one another, right? And um, people coming together across the industry, discipline to discipline, who really wouldn't have the opportunity to come together with one another. And oftentimes, it's someone on the creative side coming together with someone on the business side in the industry. Um, a really interesting example is a um, an architectural visualization specialist coming together with a um, real estate investor and the two of them forming a joint venture partnership and going out and um, initiating um, real estate development projects together, right? And doing it in ways with one another they, they really wouldn't have been able to do on their own, right? And, and, and you know, lots and lots and lots of similar examples. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, look, I, I sometimes think about it um, in terms of what we don't want, Right. And, and, mm -hmm. and solving for that, right. What we don't want in our day to day is um, conflict and adversity and mistrust and, um, um, you know, recoiling, you know, to, to, to a place of isolation and, um, Right. And, 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 and so this community, this brick and wonder community is about solving for those things and really opening up things for people and where, where they feel yeah. limited and constrained, um, bringing, you know, a wealth of resources and people, namely, look, it's like I said, it's really about the people and the, the group is currently 
um, 280 professionals, and we grow fairly slowly. Um, about five new members a month, Ryan, and our team, we're now a team of four people, um, including myself. Um, we get to know everybody who comes forward and expresses interest in becoming a member. Um, oftentimes it's the current membership who are recommending new members, you know, that's really the best way for people to come in, but sometimes people just learn about us and they come to us, which we, which we also welcome. Um, we talk to them, we get to know them. Um, we talk about what Brick and Wonder is about, our set of values, our way of engaging with one another, and we help them, you know, either opt in, step in. To what we're doing or or not right and and um it's <clears throat> it's a different way of networking and and business building that's tied back to relationship building love it how does this how does brick and wonder influence the culture of inside of your own studio yeah because i can imagine that's quite that's quite a unique uh kind of relationship as well where you actually you know, the 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 Lang Studio is, you know, the same co-founder of of Brick and Wonder, and actually, you're really encouraging relationships and nurturing those and communication. Very interesting to see how how does it reflect back actually into the culture of the studio. Yeah, it's very much a work in progress, right? I mean, as 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 much as we embrace these values, Ryan, it's not easy. You know, mm -hmm. the Brick and Wonder team works together with the architecture and development team in the same studio. We're all in one space. We all have lunch together every Monday, um, one o'clock. We order a lunch in and we spend an hour and a half together and um, we go around the room. It's, it's currently a group of 18 people. Um, the team and we go around the room and everybody shares a personal story and a work related story. And, um, you know, generally anecdotes, experiences, um, challenges, questions, problems, learnings, um, you know, and they usually have to do with other people, right? Like other people that we're working with clients, collaborators, contractors, suppliers, consultants. Um, it's interesting, right? But it's not surprising. And look, we have to come back around into that place and we, you know, we can force this conversation to happen once a week and it's really, really helpful. Um, it's what happens is we all get busy, we all have this mode of heads down, getting the work done, um, you know, getting to the deadline, get, getting information to the client, getting something built, you know, putting out a fire. And what's really, really hard to do is step back from all that and get perspective on it and, and get to a place of intentionality around this set of values um, that tie back to the people that we work with and the building of relationships, right? So look, we we we're very mindful of bringing this value set into the whole of our studio, and we're 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 good at it. On the one hand, on the other hand, it's a work in progress. I mean, look, I can tell you, um, right now, this last week, I've been myself in the doldrums because a project of ours has gone a little bit south. Not. To the place of you know beyond return right and why has it gone south because the relationships have gone south and why have the relationships started to go south it's because communication broke down and mm -hmm. i'm you know i am really beating myself up about it right because wow I'm, I'm supposed to be good at this stuff right i think about this stuff a lot um, it's really important to me. How did this happen? Well, it happens to me just like it happens to everybody. And just because our studio has this value set doesn't mean that we're, um, you know, insulated from the problems, right? And the challenges. We have the same problems and challenges that everybody else has. And we, you know, live and breathe it every day. And, you know, I'm going to have to find my way 
um, in this current challenge, this current project, this current set of relationships, you know, back to that better place, back to that positive place. And it's, you know, it's through like, okay, what, what went wrong here? How did the communication break down? And, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we get to a better place? Right. So it's, 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 um, I, I tell you, it's, it's helpful super helpful we had in a certain sense have a have an edge have an advantage right brick and wonder the heart of it the you know the 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 team is sitting you know right in our studio we can plug into that at any moment right um but um but look it's it's tough for us too the good news is most of the time things are going really quite well for us and we're we're fortunately more and more getting to this place of joy um Mm -hmm. And, um, but we have to be intentional about it. I mean, it looks like any relationship, you know, people talk about this in marriages, right? How, <clears throat> wow, you have to always work at it. And, um, you know, it seems surprising, like really God, you know, you, you should be able to get married and it should just flow. It should just, you know, it should just work, it should just take care of itself. And then, you know, everybody's reminded, well, no, it doesn't work that way. You know, you, you, you constantly have to be intentional. You have to work at it. Look, same thing with, with 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 us and all of our projects and all of our relationships even though we have brick and wonder sitting right there at our fingertips all day every day so yeah amazing amazing it's it's very interesting obviously to 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 hear that and like you know the i guess the power of these kind of communities and networks as well is you being able to take a problem and share it with other people because of some obviously when we've got a, a problem we're inside of it and we're not always able to to see it rationally logically or we're not there's blind spots yeah. just because of our the way that we're participating so closely with it particularly in relationships and sometimes just having the space to safely share what this relationship is happening somebody from the outside can be like oh well why aren't you doing this or so and in, in, in some cases, it can be as simple as just relaying exactly the same words you've just said back to you for you to go, oh, well, actually, when I when now I've now I've been listened to, I can actually see that this is where we're in a blind spot here and there's there's potential solutions. It's really, really lovely. Like this is the part of the richness of communication and and working with people um, that there is so much nuance and. And, and challenge that it's We're- it's absolutely right Ryan. you know the 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 one of the things we do inside the brick and wonder community is we we convene once a month um in person with members in a round table discussion um and we bring one topic in in into that group that we know is going to be of common interest to everybody. And what you're describing right now, um, you know, just like the little blind spots, if you will, that we all have um, are exactly what comes up in these discussions. And um, it's good revelatory. Um, You know, people have revelations in these meetings every time around these blind spots that we all experience. Right. And, and Mm -hmm. that's what we're doing for each other in the community all the time. That's what it's about of helping one another um, get through these blind spots um, in a proactive way, hopefully. Sometimes yeah. we're talking about things yeah. that have already happened and already gone wrong, but um, what we're working towards is 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 being able to um, be more and more proactive and get out of, out in front of our blind spots. Mm-hmm. With the type of uh, collaborators that are part of the community, you mentioned there the, the kind of uh, relationship developed between some visualizers and a real estate brokers or real estate developers and being able to create an interesting business proposition is there kind of traditional relationships architect developer architect contractor builder and projects are sort of emerging where its work is being passed around or is it more proactive in the sense you might get an architect and a developer kind of working together and finding a site together and leading that was it a, a mix a mix of all of them it's a mix. It's a mix, right? The, the, there, there's quite a bit of um, um, people just simply tapping each other for their 
ongoing project needs. Mm-hmm. Um, a, 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 a publicist is looking for um, a, a new set of photographers to bring in to um, document the, the, the projects for their clientele, right? And, you know, comes to us and in, in, in order to come together with new photographers, right? Or, I mean, look, pick an example, <clears throat> <clears throat> you know, an architect's looking for a new structural engineer to build a relationship with, or um, a developer is looking for a new window manufacturer to bring into their into their mitts, into their project, right? I mean, look, all these things, we all have these ongoing needs around our projects. Everybody does. And so, yes, as a matter of course, that happens. The, that's great. The reason why that's less interesting to us is because those relationships will tend to start at 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 the at the at the at a place of transaction, right? And we find the the other scenarios where where people's relationships with with one another that will that eventually lead to projects um, are more interesting and more layered, where. Um, it starts with discussions, common interests, um, and you know, and 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 begins with the relationship, you know. Um, and Brick and Wonder is very, very much about starting with relationships, leading with relationships rather than leading with transactions. Now, mm-hmm. you know, look, it, it sometimes has to start with the transaction and then kind of come back to the relationship, and that's of course okay, but it's a little less interesting to us. Yeah, brilliant. What's in store for the rest of 2022 for both Lang Studio and Brick and Wonder? Right. Well, um, Lang Studio is actually looking for our next property to acquire. Um, In the meantime, um, we're working on a whole host of really, really interesting projects. We're doing our first um, large art gallery project in New York City. We're converting a five-story building into a um, gallery space for a Swiss-based gallery. So that's an interesting project we're doing in the city. And we're doing a whole series of um, residential and hospitality projects um, outside of the city in different places, mostly um, in the East Coast, across Pennsylvania, New York, Connecticut, um, and then down into the Southeast with in South Carolina, Mississippi. So, um, including working with um, landowners and developers to help them kind of strategize and envision their own development projects. Um, uh, one very notable one is a 4,000 acre preserve in Pennsylvania that we're working on that's going to have 70 home sites. So um, that one's really exciting. On, on the Brick and Wonder front, one of the things that we're working on um, as we look to um, um, grow into next year is um, bringing the Brick and Wonder dynamic and the Brick and Wonder community to our members' teams. Okay, so Brick and Wonder operates right now at the level of the individual. Um, and and most of our members are company owners, um, principals, leaders, senior leaders, right? Mm-hmm. And that leaves out, in a certain sense, everybody's teams. And this includes our team. The Lang Studio team oftentimes is sitting out at the periphery of what goes on inside Brick and Wonder, you know, and is looking, look, look, looking in from the outside. So um, we very much want to find ways of bringing in everybody's teams so that they're interacting with the Brick and Wonder. So we have lots of ideas along those lines, and we'll be rolling, rolling those out um, uh, coming into next year. Fantastic. Brilliant. Well, I think that's a perfect place for us to conclude the conversation. Drew, absolutely fascinating talking with you about the power of collaboration, the power of relationships and your own uh, insights into running a business. So thank you very much. Ryan, thank you. I really enjoyed the conversation. 
And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.